this evening for just that beautiful expression of worship. Lord, as we enter in to your presence, Lord, with a grateful heart, we lift up our being, for indeed, Lord, we would see Jesus. We ask, Lord, during this week, as we sanctify this time set apart, we ask, Lord, that all earthly pulls will be laid aside, that truly we might look up, that we might see heaven, that we might see a perspective of eternity, Lord, that we might walk toward you. And I would ask this evening, Lord, that each of us, as we're here for the week, or however long, Lord, that our hearts will be touched, our lives. Lord, that which brought us the desire, the need within our being, we ask, Lord, that that need, that desire, will find its full outworking. Our lives, families, loved ones, churches. Lord, whatever the burden that we have, we ask, Lord, your direct intervention, your hand, your moving, your touching our lives, lifting us, Lord. We're believing and asking, Lord, an open heaven this week. And Lord, in the authority of your resurrection, in that authority, we speak forth the word of the Lord to the heavens. Be opened. Hallelujah. Heavens be opened. Every principality, every power, every hindrance, every obstacle. Lord, in Jesus' name, we push back. We push back every power of darkness, every negative word. And we release Pinecrest into a place of blessing. We release Pinecrest into, Lord, your anointing, your presence. We're believing, we're asking, Lord, an open heaven that the sun, the S-O-N, might shine brightly, Lord. Touch us, move on us, quicken us. Bring forth, Lord, your best in and through us. And carefully, Lord, respectfully, Lord, we give you the glory. For we ask it, Lord, in the name that's eternally worthy, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Glory, hallelujah. Amen, and you may be seated. And for each and every one that's here for however long, for days or weeks or months or years, whatever it may be, welcome. Appreciate tremendously your being here. I'm looking forward to the services each evening. The schedule for the week is real simple. After the meeting tonight, for those that desire prayer, we'll be here to pray with you. And we'll be here as long as anyone's still here. But, but after the service, we pray and dismiss. So if you want to slip out for any reason, you're free, absolutely free to do so. You don't need to feel a bit embarrassed. If you want to stay and to be prayed for for a time of prayer, you're encouraged to do so. But you're free to slip out of the service. The dining room will be open for fellowship, refreshments, and I want to encourage you to spend some time in the dining room, meet others, talk to others, and introduce yourself to people that you don't know. And then <clears throat> tomorrow morning, breakfast 7 to 8.30, but in the middle of breakfast, breakfast 7 to 8.30, but right in the middle, 7.30 date in the third year classroom up in the front building in the lobby, prayer, communion and encourage you to come. I'll be there each morning the rest of the week. And looking forward to that. Then chapel, 9 o'clock, class 10, 11, and afternoons open, and again the evening service at 7 through Friday evening. So again, just welcome. If you have a question or anything, you can ask up at the desk or catch me, either coming or going and whatever. So appreciate your being here and looking forward to the meetings this week and all that the Lord has. And I'm believing for the heavens to open. For years I prayed specifically concerning Pinecrest for an open heaven over this place. 
that those that, that turn in the lane out here from the highway, that when a car turns, or you turn, however, that immediately the presence of the Lord will be there. And all the time that you're here, in the meetings, the dining room, the hallways, your rooms, on the grounds, that there be the, a, a special blessing, a special opening of the presence of the Lord. And I look forward to that. And that's a prayer and a desire that Pinecrest might be a place set apart where we can meet the Lord. And over the years, I've had probably hundreds. I think, I think that's probably conservative. Tell me, this, this is over 30 years, so a long time. I first came here in, on July the 4th, 1959. I was here two and a half years, then gone for time and back, and so now I'm sort of in and out. But I've been here actually, except for a few years since 1959. And the constant prayer and desire of my heart has been that this would be a place where there would be an open heaven, where the Lord's people can come and meet the Lord in a very special way. Glory, thank you, Lord. So I'm just believing for that and contending and appreciate your prayers this week that the Lord's going to open the heavens and meet us. You know, just that touch, just the Lord touching our lives, moving, quickening. It's interesting. And we, you, don't, you don't need to turn to it, but I'm just make just a comment. In Revelation 3, 1, the Lord said, You have a name that you live, but you're dead. You have a name, that is the name of Jesus. We, we're looking to what he did in our behalf. But he said, you, you have all that. You recognize it. You have faith, you're believing in what Jesus did for you. But you've not personally responded. It's not become an inner personal reality within your lives. It's an it's a objective, a judicial truth, but it's not become experiential. It's not been personalized within your life. And so I'm believing that in this week, that whatever it may take, that the Lord can literally break in in a greater measure to whatever extent that we've met the Lord, that we can go further, that we can come closer, that we can know the Lord more personally. And it's that that I'm really looking for. In 1959, I, had a, I was involved in a major visitation that absolutely changed my life. And I've been going on that from then until now, and it's still not exhausted. But I'm earnestly seeking, desiring, asking the Lord for a fresh experience that, again, I can stand in front of that burning bush and meet the Lord for that impartation. And when the Lord, when the presence of the Lord touches our lives, to whatever extent, be it a powerful or even just a, a gentle nudge, but when the Lord touches our lives, it does something for us that nothing else could ever do. There's something about that. We were created for that. We were made for it. And I'm just believing for each of us that somehow the Lord's going to break into our lives and touch us. And we enter into that personal experience with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Anyone? Anything that you'd like to share? Anybody feeling anything that needs to be said? Anyone at all? If you don't, you'll have to listen to me. <laughs> Glory. Uh, you're free to move prophetically, to interrupt. I don't mind being interrupted at all. And the Holy Spirit doesn't interrupt himself by that. It doesn't mean that you've got to be quiet because I'm speaking. It just means that the Holy Spirit can move through me or he can move through you. And it's all one and the same. You're absolutely free to move, give expression to whatever. You're encouraged to do it. If any of you sing specials, please put a little note up here with your name on it and appreciate it tremendously for a special. And if any of you want to talk to me, just grab me and we'll figure out a way to do it. I'm here all week and I'm just looking forward to something very special in the Lord during this week. Amen. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Okay, we're going to pray once more. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have this evening through Friday evening to give expression to that which you placed upon my heart, the burden, Lord, 
the preparation of a people for this day. And I would ask, Lord, this evening, in a very special way, that our lives will be touched, moved upon, quickened. And we thank you, Lord. Lord, grant us a hearing ear, a receptivity of spirit, an ability to understand. And I ask, Lord, a prophetic tongue that your word will come forth. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All that the Lord created, he created in six prophetic days, not calendar days, not even thousand-year days. But I believe that a day, scripture, in, in the sense of creation, is an indeterminate length of time in which a specific purpose is accomplished. And so days, the days, I believe, of creation are of an indeterminate length. But the Lord created all that he created in six days. And if we view these as thousand-year days and in that sense, then there, there, there's a certain principles that we can get from it. And if you read the word carefully, and there, there's, what, what I'm going to share right now is, is, is approximately true within that time frame. Incidentally, just, just, just one more thing. There's been a number of books written. I've shared this when I was here two weeks ago. And almost everywhere I go, I'm sharing this. Because I feel the Lord gave me this, and I believe it's important. There's been a number of books written that have dates, you know, the return of the Lord. Maybe you have some of them. Some of them are well documented, very well written. There's one by a Marvin Byers that's excellent. And we passed most of the dates. I don't remember the name of it, but it's excellent. And we passed most of the dates. And a couple people that, one person specifically that I know that spent a lot of time researching and figured out the dates, and he said, I don't understand. The date went by, and I was very careful and researched it, and something should have happened. But the Lord gave me something on that, and it's this. The coming of the Lord, or the purpose of the Lord, are not a date. See, the, Jesus said this, no man knows the day or the hour but the, the Father. Because it's not a date. If it was a date, it could be known. But rather, and the Lord gave me a perspective on this, and if you can grasp what I want to say, it'll, you, can, then you, can, you, you won't be packing your suitcase and putting on a white dress and going out and sit, and sit up on some hilltop some night. You know, a lot of people have done that, and they've had to come back disappointed. Because the dates basically are, are pretty accurate. No man knows the day or the hour but the Father. For instance, if I say January the 15th, that's a date, but it's more than that. It's a season. It means winter. See, it's a season. If I say April the 15th, that's a date, but it's more than that. It's a season. It's spring. You plant. July the 15th. That's a date, but see, it's a season. It's the, the harvest, the crops grow. October the 15th, that's it. See, it's the season. It's the harvest. So then there, there's a progression. There's a winter season in our, in our spiritual lives. A date, sometimes a date will come, but it's not, it's not the date that's important. It's the season. There's a winter when everything seems to dry up, and the Lord has a purpose because he wants to bring forth the fresh fruition. Spring, the seed goes in germinates, begins to grow. The summer, the rain, the sun falls on it, begins to develop and grow. The fall, the harvest. Now, when a farmer buys a bag of seeds, it may say on the seed bag that, th that this seed will fully mature in 90 days or 70 days or 60, whatever. So the farmer cannot count out that many days on his calendar and put an X on that date and say, I'm going to harvest it. Because there may be a little bit of sunshine and no rain. There may be a lot of sunshine and rain. It may be a cold summer. It may be a hot summer. You see, the seasons vary. So the harvest is not a day, but rather the farmer with a trained eye looks at that field 
and he knows when it's come to full maturity. See, he knows when it's mature. When the level of maturity, when he's satisfied with the level of maturity, the, har- the sickle goes in and the crop is harvested. Therefore, the harvest is not a date, but it has to do rather with the level of maturity. Now, this is important. Each season represents a particular aspect of the Lord's dealings in our lives. The reason no one knows, because the harvest is not a date, but rather it's the Father's wisdom or satisfaction that that crop has come to the level of maturity that he's satisfied with. So the scripture says that we can hasten the day of the Lord. In other words, we can quicken it. We can actually shorten the time. How? By becoming spiritually mature quicker. Literally, we can hasten the day of the Lord, the coming of the day of the Lord, by believing for spiritual maturity, by growing, developing. If the Lord had come several years ago, or last year, some of us might have missed it because we were not mature enough. We had not really committed ourselves. We weren't ready. If the Lord came tonight, some of us might miss it. But because he's waiting, you see, he's waiting specifically that we might make that level of commitment, that we might grow spiritually, that we might come to the level of maturity where we can be a part of that harvest that's going to be lifted. So dates are basically a reference point. And the word says that a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. The Lord created all that he created in six days, the seventh day, the millennial day. The Old Testament, basically four days, 4,000 years. The New Testament, two days. Now, I said all that to say this. There's something interesting in the progression. The end of the first thousand years was the flood. Methuselah being the oldest man that ever lived when he died, the flood came. The end of the first thousand year period of time. The end of the second thousand years, Abram was called out of Ur of the Chaldees to a direct visitation of the Lord became Abraham and became the beginnings of the separation of a people, Israel, for the Lord's purpose. Abraham birthed the patriarchs who became the the 12 patriarchs, the 12 tribes, Israel, the law through Moses and, and all that applied to the Old Testament. The end of the third day approximately was the dedication of Solomon's temple when the Lord came forth in such manifest glory that the priest couldn't minister. The end of the fourth day, see the second day, Abraham was uniquely called out. And this is what I want, the second day. Abraham, uniquely called out. The end of the fourth day, John the Baptist, uniquely called apart in preparation to introduce the Messiah. He was a forerunner for the Messiah. The end of the fourth day. The end of the second day, Abraham. The fourth day, John the Baptist. The end of the sixth day, that's another 2,000 years. The end of the sixth day, the Lord's calling out a people again, an Abraham, a John the Baptist, but this time the word is very specific about those he's calling. And he refers to this body that he's calling, not an individual, one person, an Abraham, nor a John the Baptist, but rather, the word says this, as the sound of many waters. That's a corporate body. That sound of many waters is like a Niagara. It speaks of a people flowing in a channel with power. And the Lord is about to bring a restoration of understanding concerning the end times, a true understanding. He's preparing a people for the restoration of authority, of divine authority. Adam was called to have dominion. He lost it. The last Adam regained that dominion, but now that dominion is about to flow out into the body. When Jesus walked on water, he did not walk on water because he was God. But rather, Jesus said, of myself I do what? Nothing. As my Father speaks, I speak. See, he said, I've come to do the will of my Father. So then, when Jesus walked on water, he was walking in the will of his Father. Therefore, that dominion was effective. When he came to the, to the disciples that were in the boat, 
Peter called out and said, Lord, if that you bid me come. What did, Je what did Jesus say? Come. There was a word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by a word. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, Peter got out of the boat and began to walk. He did not walk on water. He had a word. See, Jesus said, come. That word reached from where Jesus was to the boat. He believed, he heard, and he believed what the Lord said. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. He heard, and faith is the substance. So he's walking on what? Substance, not on water. He's got, he's got something under him. He's not walking on water. He's walking on the word. Faith is the substance. So he's walking. And everything was fine until he looked at the water. As soon as he saw the water, the thought entered his mind, I, you can't walk on water, and down he went. You see, so something, had, see, there was an impartation. That was a preparation. But there's an authority in the last days where the Lord's going to take us far beyond the people whom he can trust with, a, with restored authority. And we're going to work away at this for the next several days. The Lord's preparing a people that he can trust with that authority. The second day, Abraham. The fourth day, John the Baptist. The sixth day, you and I. A people called out, being prepared, made ready for that, imp that special impartation. Now, if you, want to look, if you want to look up this verse, it's okay. It's Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. A very familiar verse. Philippians chapter 3. I press towards the goal or the mark for the prize. I press towards the mark for the prize of his calling. The goal then, that, that prize is not heaven. If you're saved, even those that get saved on their deathbed at the last minute. Those that were saved are genuinely saved. They all go to heaven. That's not, that's not something to, to attain to. It's, 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 it's an absolute. If we're saved, if we've accepted Jesus into our heart, that's where we're going. That's a fact. It's not a goal. I press towards the mark. We don't have to press towards heaven. Years ago, there was, oh, this would be 25 years ago, there was a song that was sort of a slur on Christians. And it was a secular song and kind of a, and it said this, if heaven is such a wonderful place, why do Christians say, try, try so hard to stay out of there? In other words, you know, the doctors and all the rest. See, if heaven is such a wonderful place, why do Christians try so hard to stay, to stay out? But I'm thinking of an elderly lady She's gone on to her eternal reward, Hattie Hammond. Most of you would not know the name. She was 95 when she passed on. and When she was young, she had died and gone to heaven. And, the, and she was there for a time, so she had a real sense of it. And the Lord asked her to come back. She came back and had an absolutely outstanding ministry all over the world. When she was 92, she was on her way to Singapore to speak at a conference. And she was, she, and she just, she had a, a capacity and ability to bring people into the presence of God like you. And I'm not putting her on a pedestal, but she had a profound ability. But she said one time when she came back that she had, that she had really had a taste of heaven. She said Every there, everything there just seemed so solid, so secure, so, so lasting, that there was so, that, that just substance, that when she came back, she said, the buildings, everything that was earthly almost seemed like it was made out of tissue paper. And she really had a hard time because the earth, the earth is a temporary thing. See, the earthly, we're, it's a probationary time. We're given 70 years, not necessarily 70 calendar years, but seven is the fullness. It's a time of probation. And the earthly is the time where we make our decisions, our choices that will affect us through the eternal ages for all eternity will be affected by the decisions and choices that we make in the here and now. And Hattie Hammond had that. So then the goal, 
or the prize that Paul is pressing towards is not heaven, but it's preparation for a higher purpose. And we're going to share that in just a moment. It's, 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 it's a preparation for a higher purpose. And I'll read it in just a moment because we have it here. One, one more verse. The next verse, 11. Well, a few verses later. Well, backwards it is. I pressed, that's verse 14. I want to back up to verse 11. Paul is saying in the outworking of this, see, I press towards the goal for the prize. But then he said that I may know him. There are different levels of knowing, like an acquaintance all the way through to an, a, a personal, intimate knowing that I may know. And that's what I shared earlier, the burden that I have. It's like a living burden. I sense it. I feel it. There's, it, it's intense of the Lord's desire to bring a people into a personal knowledge of himself, to bring a people into that area of personally knowing him, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection. There can be no resurrection except there's been a, a death. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. Then the fellowship of his sufferings, that has to do with an identification with him and the outworking of his purposes. Verse 11, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. If you read a commentary, the commentary will tell you that Paul was, was trying to get to heaven. Well, that, that's far from the truth. Heaven is, is that's, a, that's part of our, that's a gift. It's a part of our salvation. We, we don't need to earn it. When you accept Jesus, you're on your, your name's written, and you're in. Your name goes down in the Lamb's Book of Life, and, and you become your slot in heaven's reserved, whatever it may be, a mansion or, or something less than that. I, I, think, I think that, you know, I got a mansion just over the hilltop. I think all that is, we, we don't have the right perspective of what heaven really is. Streets of gold and... I remember being in a church some time ago where the pastor said, cheer up, things are rough, but someday we're all going to be in heaven. In other words, you know, that, that was the goal. Just hang on a little longer. And, and when we get there, all this will pass away. And, but the Lord has something in mind that, that transcends. And someday we will be there. There is a heaven, a literal heaven, and we're going to be there. I've often said... I've been here at Pinecrest for 30 years, and each year, each graduation, all the, all the students that are graduating, we would meet in a class, in a circle. Each one would share a, a five minutes of testimony. We'd take communion together, and this is what I would say. This side of eternity, this is in the morning, at 10 in the morning, graduation, 2 in the afternoon, graduation ends at 4, and by, by 6 o'clock, half of them are gone. Many of them never to be seen again. North, east, south, and west scatter. And each morning, 30 times at least, I've said, we will never be together again as we are this morning, this side of eternity. We've been here for a couple years together. Now we're going to scatter. We will never be together again the next year. Same thing, the next, the next, the next. But there's something I add to that. Each one is told they've got five minutes to share because... There's a limited amount of time, but I say, but in eternity, I'm going to meet with each class. And we can take three, four, five, six, seven hundred years. You know, there's no time in eternity, but, you know, an indefinite, we don't have to hurry because it's everlasting. And I can meet with each class, maybe a thousand years a class or something. Each one can just share, take their time. But I every, I've, I've told all these classes, and I said, I'm just trusting that you're going to be there that we're going to have a, a reunion in heaven. I've got to do it at least 30 times. And I'm kind of looking forward to that. See, there is, such, there is a literal heaven, but there's something more. See, if I may attain to the out-resurrection, or to, I, I may attain to the resurrection, that word resurrection there, the Greek word, it's only in the Bible once. It's a very unique, and it says an out-resurrection from among. And what it has to do with being lifted above a situation, a circumstance, being lifted, is an out-resurrection from among the living dead. In other words, Paul saw a level of experience 
where we can be quickened, moved upon, anointed, and lifted above the earthly. You know, everybody right now is, is all taken up with this YK2 thing, you know, getting ready, storing food, and getting ready for all the lights to be out and the banks to all go broke and all that. Personally, I, I, I don't think it's going to be near as bad as... There will be some disruptions. But we're supposed to be looking for the heavenly, not getting ready to preserve the flesh. And if you store a lot of stuff and everybody around you is starving, you've got to give it to them. You know, you can't hoard it to yourself. Some people are buying guns to protect what they have. And as it, literally, because they think others will come and try to take it away from them. But if, if you're a Christian, you can't do that. You've got to give it out. So you have to give it out and everybody else is hungry. Why store it? <laughs> but, there, but, but there's something else. Remember the parable of the 5,000 women besides women and children. Jesus said, you feed them. One of, Philip spoke up and said, there's a McDonald's over in the next, that was Andrew. You know, we'll send them over. There's a McDonald's in the next village. The Lord said, no, no, you feed them. Five loaves, two fishes, five and two are seven. So six and one and four and three. But it was five loaves, two fishes. There were 12 basketfuls. 12 is a, is, is, is a governmental number. Five and two. The Lord took it, broke it, multiplied it. Everyone was fed with just one little lunch. When Elijah was sent to the widow's house, she says, this is it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix what I have and then we're going to die. But they all lived on it for a long time. The marriage of Cana, the first miracle. The cistern water. They went out with cistern water. Because they went out, they filled six water pots. They didn't have time to draw water up from the well. They just got it out. Cistern waters is, is water that just drains off. It's polluted water. And they bore that to the master of the feast. And he said, why have you kept the best? Something happened. There was a transformation. And so we're living in, the Lord's preparing us for the time of the miraculous. And in the body of Christ, we're going to begin to see it. I have a tendency, I start on something, then I keep getting a little further out and out and out, and I get so far out I forget where I was. <laughs> so hopefully I'll get back. But there's something interesting. We're living in a special day, a special time. There's a young man on Long Island, through an accident, lost both arms. No stubs, both arms right at the shoulder. Not even, you know, 100%, no stub, nothing. 100% gone. And I've been praying for him for quite a while. In two different places, people that knew absolutely, nobody knew I was praying specifically. I have received two prophetic words, totally different settings, different places. And in the, the word, this was word for word. Even those with no arms will receive a restoration of their arms. Twice. And we're living in a time when the Lord's going to begin to move in miracles beyond anything we've ever seen. And I've been sharing this. This is going to happen, not through a new breed of Benny Hinn's and Oral Roberts, but in the body. Through very simple, ungifted, untalented people. We'll come back to that and spend some time on that. Now, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection, that's an out-resurrection from among. It means that the Lord is lifting us up out of the earthly from where we're totally dependent on our five physical senses and earthly provision to the place where we begin to move in the spirit at the word of the Lord, the creative word. And Paul saw this. He saw this in vision. He had, he, uh, he had visions that were unthinkable, he, that were unrepeatable because they were for the end time. He couldn't repeat them. And so there's a special work of the Lord in this day. Paul saw it, that I may attain to an out-resurrection from among the living dead, those that are just taken up with the earthly. The people of that generation that didn't know the Lord. It, it's, it's like a, 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 to them, they had a whole life. But when we look at that, that, that generation, it's like a, what, a, a, a little speck of sand in the sea. Of, 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 of humanity. Life is so short. But Paul today, the Apostle Paul, is alive 
in the presence of the Lord, more alive than he ever was. And, and by the grace of God, we're going to enter into that. If by any means I might attain to the out-resurrection, to that place of being lifted up, into the place where we become active in the Lord. Amen. Now, I mentioned just a few moments ago, heaven is not the goal. Then what is the goal? I'm going to read it. It's in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Revelation chapter 5. Verse 9. They sang a new song. This new song that they're singing isn't something that's on a transparency that we never heard before. Nor is it even a song that the Lord gives us spontaneously. I've heard that. Singing in the Spirit where a whole body of believers begin to sing a new song in total harmony. That was, that was being, it was actually forming prophetically right in that meeting. There, there's levels of revelation and worship that we can enter into that once you touch it, you'll be, you will be ruined forever. Glory, hallelujah. Now, they sang a new song. This new song, for instance, the students used to laugh when I used to say July the 4th, 1959. But on that day, I loaded the family in the car down in, at a Bible school down in central Pennsylvania, and I was on my way. I was going to go to Philadelphia. I had it all figured out. I was going to rent a storefront on Stenton Avenue in north central Philly and start a church. I'm going to rent the storefront and then start to look for a place to live. The Lord stopped me, absolutely stopped me profoundly, spoke to me and told me I was to come to Pinecrest. We had to go back, pack our suitcases. We drove up here, got here. The Lord spoke. And all this unfolded from that. You see, now that's that's. That's something that's in me. See, that's a new song. That's my song. You can't sing that. That's a unique experience to me, the outworking of that, the absolute impossibilities and all that I went through, absolutely profound in the establishing of this ministry, this place, and the workings, the dealings of the Lord. and all. See, that's my song. It, it's the Lord's workings in my life and the outworking of that. But each one of us, we have a peculiar, particular set of circumstances in our walk, our relation. That's unique to us. See, that's our song that we can sing. They sang a new song, saying, You're worthy to take the book and to open its seals, for you were slain and hath redeemed us. Some translations say them, because this is four living creatures and 24 elders. But these 24... The, these 24 elders, four living creatures, I'll just tell you what I believe about that because I may not get back to it and I may. 24 is 12 and 12. There were 12 patriarchs which became 12 tribes. When Jesus began his ministry, he chose 12 apostles that became the foundation of the church. So the 12 and 12, the Old Testament, 12 patriarchs, 12 tribes, it's the Old Testament overcomer, the 24 elders. The four living creatures. The one had the face of a lion, that spiritual authority, of a calf or an ox, depending on whether you're reading it in Ezekiel or in Revelation. That speaks of sacrifice, of sacrifice. The face of a man, that's communion, fellowship, and then the face of an eagle, that spirituality. That's the four square gospel. That's fully overcoming authority, sacrifice, fellowship, communion, and spirituality. It's the four sides of the, of the New Testament overcomer. So the four, the four living creatures are cryptic, or, or it speaks of the New Testament overcomer, the 24 elders, the Old Testament overcomers. They sang a new song saying, saying, <clears throat> You were slain, and you have redeemed us. I asked a scholar once, because most of the newer translations say them. It's because it's four living creatures and 24 elders, so they say them. But I asked a scholar that was perhaps one of the, one of, in Boston one, I was in Boston one time, and this man was probably 
one of the leading authorities in the world on New Testament text. And I got to talk to him, and I said, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, you have redeemed us or you have redeemed them? I said, which is the right translation? He said, you have redeemed us is the right, is right. Us is much, it, it's strong, it's, 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 it's the intent of the original. He said, it's the right translation. So you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. That's why I said the Old and New Testament, that spans all of history. And hath made us. See, hath made us. That's the processing of the Lord. See, that's life. We're in a probationary time. We're being prepared and made ready. Hath made us kings and priests. A king has to do with earthly authority. A priest with heavenly worship, sacrifice, ministry. A king, our earthly position in life, priest, our heavenly, have made us under God kings and priests. Now here's the part, and we shall reign. Where? What does it say? If you're there, Revelation 5.10. We shall reign. Where? On the earth. On the earth. So then, hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign. Now I believe that this is the goal that Paul was seeking for. Not heaven. See, the out-resurrection, he wanted to be caught up into this place where he became a kingdom of priests or a priestly king or kings and priests. They're all accurate. They're, they could be translated any of these ways. But we shall reign. When, <clears throat> when Satan deceived Adam and Eve, when they were deceived, he basically laughed at God and said, Now I frustrated your purpose. But in effect, the Lord said, you've not defeated it at all. For you have bruised their heel, but they will bruise your head. And I've often said, Lord, why don't you zap Satan? Life would be so nice. Why don't you just zap Satan? Life would be so nice. Lord said, I'm not going to do it. You're to do it. We shall reign. This earth has seen, see, Satan in effect, I'm not going to take time with it tonight, and we're going to finish at a reasonable time. It's going to get cooler the next day or two, so I'm told, get much cooler. I'm looking forward to it. But um, Satan in effect said that he could rule better than God. One third of the stars fell. See, demons are disembodied spirits. The word says demons cast them out. But the word says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities. Principalities wrestle, demons cast them out. So a principality is a fallen angel. A fallen angel is an individual creation. A demon is a disembodied spirit. The Bible does not tell us where demons came from. I have an idea, but it's only a guess. And you're free to guess because the Bible is silent as to where demons came from. But I'll tell you what I think. There's three, there's probably about, there's, there's two or three possibilities. One would be, one possibility would be the people before the flood that were on the earth. The Lord destroyed that generation of people, but I doubt it. I doubt that, they're, that they are disembodied humans of, of, of the Adamic race. They're waiting judgment. They could be from who knows where, outer, but I doubt that. From outer space or something, I doubt it. But Adam was told to do what concerning the earth? To replenish. Thank you. You've got it. He was told to replenish, to repopulate the earth. The earth was without form. And in Genesis, the word says the earth was without form and void. The better translation was the earth became without form and void. See, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was a full, beautiful creation. But then through Satan's intervention, it was corrupted. The people of that original creation were destroyed. So then, when someone finds a bone, a, a bone that they think is human, and they say that it's 100 million years old or 50 million years old, I don't have any problem with that because I think it's from that previous creation. There was a previous creation when the earth became without form and void, that creation was totally wiped out. 
Adam was a new creation, a new beginning. God repopulated. He destroyed the original earth that was corrupt, totally corrupted by Satan. Then Satan came, deceived Adam and Eve, affected this creation, but God had a purpose in it. So then I believe that demons are the disembodied spirits of that original creation. They're totally corrupted, and they're to be cast out because they're disembodied. The word says cast them out. Preach the word, heal the sick, cast out demons. They're disembodied spirits. Principalities, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. You wrestle, that spiritual warfare, to bring them down. So then, Satan said that he could rule better. All, all of God's creation heard. The word says one-third of the stars, that would be the angels fell. They all heard it. So God, in his, to settle the question, he could have zapped Satan, but that question would always remain. Could he? Maybe he could have. No, who, who knows? So the Lord created Adam and Eve with a probationary, the ability to choose. He created a tree of life. We have a description of the to the eye it's good for food and it's to be desired spirituality it's a root out of a dry ground having no form or comeliness no beauty that we would desire it see it's spiritual so Adam and Eve chose what looked good on the surface independence from God so for 6,000 years Satan has been the prince of this world now supposing the Lord were to pull down the curtain tonight the end and this is it he would stand before God, and God would say, you didn't do very good, did you? Just look at this, this world. Look at the mess. Hatred, strife, war, murder, famine, hatred, violence, on and on and on, the list. And Satan would say, no, nobody could rule those humans, not even you. Now, what would God say? You know, there's something interesting when it comes to the cross. The message is this, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. I'm crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live, yet not I. That's, that's a probationary, that's a choice. See, if anyone will come after me, we don't have to. Our submission to the government of God is optional. It's not enforced. So this world, the church is covered. Well, tomorrow night or so we'll come to that. I won't spend some time on this. But <clears throat> the world, you know, th the world has a view of the church. I've been sharing this recently because I believe the Lord gave it to me. The world's view of the church is something like a mosquito bite. You know, it itches a little bit, but it'll go away. In other words, the world just considers the church to be a nuisance. The church is hidden from the world. And so the world has no fear nor respect for Christians. In fact, they're, 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 they're martyring them, killing them. And they're get, seemingly getting away with it. Seemingly. They'll, they'll, there's, there's a judgment. But the word says, See, thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall, what? Reign. Now, I want to read Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 2. I'll find it in a minute. I've got a, new, a different Bible. And so... It's Revelation chapter 2, verse 26. And he who overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give what? Revelation 2, 26. Will I give what? Power over what? The nations. See, we don't have that today. We're a victim of governments all over the world. The church is, is a victim. 
He shall rule them with what? A rod of iron. That's judgment. Severe judgment that's going to come through the church. The Lord's preparing. See, the world has seen how Satan rules. They've seen it. War, hatred, violence, famine, starvation, murder, strife, contention. They've seen all that. They've never seen a righteous rule. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, which results in great joy throughout the earth. All the earth will break forth in singing, the word says. The sword will be beaten into a plowshare, so on and so forth. So then, this world will see how God rules. Then the end. The question as to who can rule best will be forever solved. But because Satan thought that he was frustrating the purpose of God when he deceived Adam and Eve, the Lord said, I'm going to raise up from the seed of Adam a body of overcomers, people who are committed, sold out, who I'm preparing, who in the end time I'm going to empower. And to see, that out-resurrection means we're going to be lifted up. Now, here's my, my, my doctrine, my end-time doctrine. It's real simple. There's the day of preparation. At the end of that day, we will be lifted or empowered. Those who are, who are rightly prepared will be lifted and empowered. A day of manifestation and then the eternal ages, the higher purposes of God. See, the outworking of the kingdom. So then, it's just real simple. So there's all kinds of words the earth has like rapture and all these things. And, and the view, common view of rapture is that we're all going to go to heaven, then the Lord's going to deal with all the nations and get everything ready for us to come back and enjoy. What I'm saying is the Lord's getting us ready, that that work of preparation will be done through the church. The catching up is spiritual and has to do with an empowering of a people for the end time purpose. To him who overcomes will I give authority over the nations and he'll rule them with a rod of iron. That's discipline and authority. That's not enjoying something, coming back to enjoy something that's already done. But rather, it's doing it in preparation. So then, the Lord is getting us ready. Paul saw this, and he prayed for that out-resurrection into that day. And he said, you see, that I might be caught up, that I might be in that place, prepared and made ready. So then, to him who overcomes, and keeps my works to the end. To him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. The Lord's getting us ready for that. In Revelation 5, again, remember 5 and verse 10. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign. That's government. Where? On the earth. See? So they sang a new song. Those that are being prepared, we shall reign where? On the earth. So that's that rule of the rod of iron, and the Lord's getting us ready. Now, we're going to work on this all week, and I want to go through this in greater detail, and hopefully by the end of the week, I will have got it said, what, I, what I'm feeling. So we'll just work away at it. But that's the idea, and this is where I believe we're... See, Paul saw this. So heaven is not the goal, but our being prepared to rule with that rod of iron. Here's something interesting while we're here. Psalm 100... I believe it's 148 or 149. Psalm. I'll get back there. Whoops. All right, Psalm 149, verse 5. Remember they sang a new song? All right, now, let the, this is, this is Psalms 149, verse 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them what? Sing. See, they sang a new song. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign. Now let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword they'll rule with what? A rod of iron. Let a two-edged sword 
the word and the spirit, to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the people, to bind their kings with chains and nobles with fetters of iron. To him who overcomes, will I give authority over the nations, and he'll, they'll rule them with what? Rod of iron. Here it is, a different wording, the same thing. The saints. Who's the saints? We are. That's us. This is end time. To execute judgment on, on them, the writ, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor has all what? His saints. That's us. So it says to bind their kings, punishments on the people, to execute vengeance. They'll rule with a rod of, see, it fits like a hand in a glove. So the Lord's getting us ready, not for the rapture. You'll have to excuse me. You know, I was at a little, some, some time ago, I was traveling in, way out in country Virginia, one of these beautiful little white churches at a crossroads, and there was a sign on the billboard out front, and it sounded kind of cute, but, it, but it, it, it's, it's spiritually deadly, dangerous. It said this, when Gabriel blows his horn, I'm out of here. Now, that sounds kind of neat. But what that means is they have their suitcases packed and they're ready to go and they're waiting for Gabriel to blow his horn and they're, they're, they're gone, off to heaven. But the, but the word says the Lord's getting us ready to bind the kings, to execute judgment, to rule with a rod of iron. He's preparing a body of overcomers because he's going to demonstrate his rule. His rule will bring righteousness which will result in peace and great joy. The earth has never seen that, but they're going to see it. But he's going to do it when the head and the body get into that orientation where the head has the authority and begins to exercise it through the body. The world's going to see something they've never seen. So the days of Ananias and Sapphira are going to return. Discernment, the ability to discern and judge. And when, when and those that... that the, 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 the evil, those that, the drug dealers, on and on and on, are literally going to cry for the rocks to fall on them, that is to hide them, because they don't want to repent or give up their ways. And they're going to be so exposed and dealt with that they'll literally cry for the rocks to fall on them because of the authority that's going to be restored. Whew, hallelujah. Glory. Amen. You see, the Lord's patiently waiting. The world has seen how Satan rules. They have never seen how God rules. We're almost there. We're at the end of the sixth day. We'll work at that a little more. There's a lot in scripture that tells us that. We're in the season. We're in that time. It's not a date. It's a season. And we're being prepared and made ready. Amen. Glory. Okay, I've said what I'm going to say tonight. So let's all stand. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I know this is different than many of us have heard or been taught. And I just ask, Lord, that you'll faithfully, for each of us, show us your word, the truth, that we will minister according to the word, your truth. And I ask, Lord, that you'll show us Bring us into an understanding of your word in preparation for all that's before us. Help us, Lord, to relate to that which you're speaking rightly. And that which is of you, Lord, I ask that it be quickened, confirmed within us. That which is not, just melt it away, and we release it into the sea of nothingness. And I thank you, Lord, for that which you're showing in this day, the opportunity that we have to become a partaker of that which you're about to do. I thank you, Lord, for a people that are spiritually hungry, open, desirous to go further in your word, to hear from heaven a fresh word. And I ask, Lord, in the time that we have through Friday evening that we can come into a more full understanding of your ways of that which you're doing a present word lord that which you're speaking accomplishing and doing in this day lord we just ask lord the outworking of that present word and now lord as we dismiss 
for those that slip out of the service. We just ask a good night's rest, a special blessing and peace upon each one. We ask that the weather, Lord, literally will cool down, that we'll have some good weather this week. that will be much cooler. We just ask, Lord, that you'll air condition this campus and grounds. Oh, Lord, from without. And we thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord. And for those of us that stay for a time of prayer, we ask that we might be quickened, moved upon, and anointed together. And now, Lord, as we dismiss, we dismiss in your presence, thanking you, Lord, for your word. For we love you, Lord, and we greatly desire to understand your ways and enter therein. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.